Yep, that's right. All this time, you've been hanging out with a bad kid. So there are a few times I got in trouble for computer-related shenanigans at school, but funnily enough, I don't think it was ever because I'd done something intentionally malicious. The first time was because my friends and I were using that stick figure animation program, Pivot. My school was trying to crack down on games because, and this is true, the previous year I'd gotten all my friends into Project 64 and we were pretty much playing it any opportunity we could. That being said, I thought we were being pretty responsible. We only played when we had permission, and we generally stuck to family-friendly games like Mario Kart or Mario Tennis. But maybe they thought it reflected badly on them, or that we'd start playing something violent like Smash Brothers. So they eventually passed a rule against it. She used to stand out the front going, No! Project 64. When we started using Pivot, we thought we were complying with the rule because we didn't really consider Pivot a game. I mean, we made animations in PowerPoint too, and that obviously wasn't against the rules. Sadly, the school didn't see it that way, so we got banned from the computers for about a month. The second time, I was banned for a whole semester for using Mozilla Firefox. This one, I'm not gonna lie, was pretty BS. I mean, it's not like it got around the filters or anything fun like that. I just didn't want to use Internet Explorer 6. But they told me Firefox, quote, made the network unstable, which sounds like more of a you problem than a me problem, but anyway, that got me banned for a while. But the time I really got in trouble was several years later in high school. I can't think of anyone I know that has gotten suspended except me. Like, what do people get suspended for? Getting into fights? Ah, Philistine, we combat with words, not fists. I do know a girl who got expelled for putting pencil shavings in her teacher's coffee. Never saw her again. But that's pretty much all I can remember. Now before we get into what I did, let's get this sponsor out of the way. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for creating a beautiful and professional looking website with no hassle. If you're looking to start a business, blog, online store, or really any kind of web presence, Squarespace is the easiest way to do it. They have hundreds of responsive templates to suit any need you may have, and you get a fantastic WYSIWYG editor that lets you do anything, no code required. But if you do like to code, you can also enter custom CSS and header code anywhere you want. I especially like running my online store on Squarespace because it means that all that delicate payment information is being handled by widely used and well-tested code, rather than something cobbled together by me at 2am. So if you're looking for a convenient and straightforward way to make a website, look no further than squarespace.com. They have a free trial that lets you check out all of their features, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash mattkc to save 10% off your first purchase. So here's what I did. It was the start of the school year in 2011, and my school was rolling out a brand new laptop program. Every student in our year would be getting one school-sanctioned laptop. It's pretty exciting when you're 14. I think we were the first or maybe second grade to ever get them, so it was all very new, it was all a big deal, and they were very much still working out the kinks. And boy did I give them some useful information. <laughs> the laptops we got were these tiny 11-inch Acer things, and everyone immediately hated them. They were slow, they were small, the keyboards were crammed, it was hard to read anything on the screens, they were loaded with school bloatware, the internet was filtered even at home so you couldn't play games or watch YouTube on them after school. I actually had a feeling going into the program that what we'd get would be pretty underwhelming, but it really was bad. By far the worst part was the slowness. It could take as long as five minutes just to log in. Not even boot, just log in. And even after they logged in, they continued to be slow for simple tasks like web browsing or opening Microsoft Word. Something that amused us nerds was that the school had preloaded Windows XP on them, despite the fact that each one was wallpapered with Design for Windows 7 stickers, complete with a Windows 7 product key on the bottom, which was ostensibly going unused. I get that in large businesses you want to stick with what's tried and true as much as possible, and I also get that today there's a lot of XP nostalgia but back then it was a little disappointing to be getting last year's OS, last decades if you want to get technical. Needless to say, the excitement of getting a free laptop, for many kids their first laptop, very quickly wore off. Except for me, I had an idea. At the time I was very big into clean installs of Windows. I'd spent my whole childhood using the family computer, which was always filled with crap that I couldn't do anything about, so when I finally got a computer of my own, I was obsessed with keeping it clean. Any time that I sensed my computer getting a little bit slow or a little bit messy, I just reinstall Windows, just blow it all away and start over. <laughs> and I'd gotten it down to a science. I had all the software installers I need neatly organized into folders, as well as any settings I might need to restore. I was at a point where I would completely reinstall Windows and be up and running within the hour. 
So when it came to these laptops, I had a theory. If I was able to install a clean copy of Windows 7 on there, surely I could get something that at least logged in in a reasonable amount of time. Within days of getting my school laptop, I was already looking at my options for booting off external media. And I was in luck. While they obviously locked the BIOS, what they didn't lock was the F12 temporary boot menu, which if you didn't know, allows you to choose a different device to boot from just for this one session. And even better, they hadn't locked out booting from USB. So pretty soon I was booting off a USB DVD drive into the Windows 7 installer. Yes, back when disks were still the main way of installing OS's. Once I'd booted into the installer, I discovered something very interesting. These laptops came with 320 gig hard drives, but only the first 160 gig was partitioned. Presumably, whatever image they used to set these up with was partitioned that way too. I'm not really sure why, if I had to guess, maybe the image was built on an earlier version of the laptop with a smaller hard drive, or maybe it was just faster to image that way, but for whatever reason, effectively a whole half the disk was going unused, and, well, wouldn't it be a shame if someone installed Windows there? I knew that what I was about to do could get me in trouble. I knew that while there was no explicit don't dual boot Windows rule, that if they found out, they'd find some reason to bring the hammer down. I stepped back, assessed the situation carefully, and smashed that motherfucking next button. Okay, yeah, installing Windows is a very quiet form of rebellion. In fact, the whole process was very uneventful. The install went off without a hitch, almost as if these laptops were designed for Windows 7 or something. But despite the uneventfulness, it was actually really exciting to think of what the laptops could be like unencumbered by the school's bloatware. And it was unbelievable what a difference that made. No more staring at login screens for minutes at a time, no more hard drive thrashing away just trying to open a simple web browser. On a clean install of Windows 7, I was at the desktop in just under a minute, and using Chrome in just a few seconds. My hunch was right. These laptops weren't as bad as the school's bloatware was making us think. And as the administrator of this install, I could do anything that I wanted. I could play games, watch YouTube, listen to music on iTunes. This thing's potential had officially been unlocked. Not only that, the Windows installer automatically sets up a boot menu if it detects a pre-existing install. So at school, I could boot back into their XP partition so everything looked legit. And as long as I kept it on the download, no one would ever figure out what I'd done. But that's not what you do in high school. What you do is immediately brag to your friends the next day that you've done something really cool. Bonus points if it's against the rules. And immediately, they wanted it too. And I was more than happy to oblige. I started taking my friends' laptops home with me, sometimes several at a time, installing Windows 7 and the necessary drivers while watching 20-somethings play video games on YouTube, and the next day I'd hand it back to them with a shiny new install ready for them to use. And while this was probably against the school's rules, technically, from a legal sense, we were being pretty responsible. Remember, every single laptop had its own Windows 7 product key on the bottom, so every single install could be legitimately activated. Soon, all of my friends were dual booting Windows 7 with XP. It was hard to pass up the opportunity to make the laptops objectively better, especially since the original partition gave us the perfect cover. As long as we stuck to using their install at school, no one would find out that we'd done anything wrong. But none of us were going to do that. We wanted faster laptops at school. We wanted to be able to surreptitiously play Minecraft in the back of the classroom. For a while, we were actually forced to use the XP partitions at school, simply because we didn't have access to the school Wi-Fi on our Windows 7 partitions. But all of that changed when one of my friends, and I still don't exactly know how, managed to import the Wi-Fi profile from the XP partition into Windows 7. And because he was an administrator on 7, he could just click show password, and suddenly we all knew what the school Wi-Fi password was. This was actually its own little revolution. Suddenly people could use the school Wi-Fi on their phones or on laptops they brought in from home. It was filtered, obviously, but still generally preferable to cellular data or no internet at all. I was asked for the school Wi-Fi password so often that eventually I memorized it, and despite the fact it was a random string of numbers and letters, I can still remember it to this day. While games were obviously the motivation for a lot of people wanting to install Windows 7 on their laptops, for me it was kind of like a war mission, freeing everyone from the shackles of slow computing and harsh restrictions. It was amazing how much people were actually able to do once they had a usable OS. One of my friends installed Adobe After Effects, bought a USB capture card and started making COD montages on this tiny little laptop. Even I tried pushing the boundaries by installing then modern games like Portal 2 and Modern Warfare 2. And while it was obviously no gaming powerhouse, 
At 640x480, I could get some surprisingly playable speeds. The movement had become such a mainstay of our conversations that we knew we needed a way to refer to it without arousing suspicion. Windows 8 wasn't a thing yet, so we started to call it 8 minus 1. <laughs> Yo, can you get me 8 minus 1? Sure thing, dude. I got you. It was like we were dealing drugs, but with fewer side effects. And for me, it was surprisingly fun to be kind of at the center of it all. As more and more people got a hold of it, I started getting people way outside my friendship group asking for it too. Popular kids, girls that never would have spoken to me before were asking me to pretty please make their laptops faster, and how could I say no? Looking back, it was inevitable that word would spread to the adults, and there were some particularly sloppy moments that didn't help. More than once, a teacher looked over our shoulders and noticed something a little odd about some of these laptops. More than once, a teacher offered to install a printer or something and found that all of the school's software was mysteriously missing. And more than zero times, a particularly foolish friend brought their laptop into the school's IT department and asked them for help while booted into Windows 7. I don't exactly know when they found out, or which incident tipped them off first, but there weren't exactly a lack of ways it could have happened. <laughs> At the end of the school year, I was randomly pulled out of class, called into the library, and the lady there said, I kid you not, what do you know about 8 minus 1? <laughs> and I was never a very good liar, I knew the jig was up, someone had snitched on me, so I just told them the truth. To be honest, the adults were all pretty understanding about it. I was in trouble, obviously, but no one really yelled at me or even really told me off. I think they all sensed that I didn't mean any real malice, I was just a nerdy kid doing nerdy shit. The one adult that was mad though, as far as I know, was the school principal. <laughs> she never spoke to me directly, but word came down that she was fucking furious. Apparently she was deathly afraid that this whole situation would put the school's contract with Microsoft in jeopardy. I don't know how, I mean, obviously I don't know the particulars of their contract, but all the installs were legit, and I highly doubt Microsoft would cut off an entire school just because a couple kids dual booted their laptops. But it didn't matter what I thought, judgement was swift and vengeful. My pastoral care advisor took me aside one day and said, so, they want to suspend you for two days. And I think even he thought it was kind of an overreaction because I remember I asked him, okay, well, do I have to do anything on those two days? And he said, nope, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> so I had a couple days off. It was the end of the year, so I didn't miss any crucial lessons or anything like that. It was literally just an extra weekend in the middle of the week. I think I played Halo Reach. When I came back, we were all ordered to have our laptops re-imaged to remove the filth we'd brought upon this cursed land. No one else got suspended other than me, none of us lost laptop privileges because of it. There actually was a kid I knew who did get his laptop taken off him, but not because I gave him Windows 7, because I didn't, it was because apparently he had a collection of porn on there. <laughs> Amateur. And possibly the funniest part of all is that when we got our laptops back, sans Windows 7, I realized they'd done nothing to disable the boot menu, and the partition still only took up the first half of the disk. So technically, nothing was stopping us from just doing it all over again. But we didn't. That really was the end of the 8-1 saga. I think none of us really wanted to risk it anymore, and by then we were a whole year older than we first got them, and many of us were starting to get our own laptops at home and just started bringing those into school instead. But there was something kind of special about the 8-1 era. For that one year, we had a tight-knit community bonding over breaking the rules and getting the absolute most out of some low-powered hardware. I'm glad I'm not in school anymore, but I do miss little things like that every now and then. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the story. Let me know in the comments if you have a similar one. I'd love to read about it. Until then, I'll see you all in the next one. Bye, guys.